yeah, I'm Macaulay Peterson. I'm an editor at Blockworks News. Uh, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm really ha happy to be joined by uh, someone who I, I, I have gotten to know just a little bit in, the re in recent weeks and has a very interesting project. And this is uh, Hugo Fillion from Flare Network. And uh, well, to start with, I just would like if you wouldn't mind just giving your, a brief introduction about yourself, your background, and what Flare Network is, since it has yet, yet to launch. There may be people in the audience who, who uh, have, don't yet know as much about it. My background is uh, I was a commodity. Volume. Yeah, there we go. Let's, let's get some volume. Uh, I was a commodity volatility trader at a, a couple of hedge funds in London. Uh, got bored of that, decided to go back to university and study machine learning. Um, and that's where I met my two co-founders, uh, Nairi Usha and Sean Rowan. Uh, and we're now a team of about 45 people spread across Slovenia, Sweden, US, Portugal, um, predominantly engineers, about 40 engineers and about five ecosystem people. And Flare is essentially uh, a fast EVM layer one. It has two core protocols that kind of make it interesting as a layer one. First is it has a native oracle for prices based on proof of stake. The second and possibly more interesting mechanism is it has something we call the state connector. The state connector is a deterministic oracle. It's the only oracle in the space that actually has a consensus protocol. So it has a binary forking consensus protocol that uses the network to come to consensus over external data. And this allows Flare to act as an eye in the sky. Okay, um, the, 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 when people think about bridges, I mean, probably a lot of them will uh, come to many of the, the bridge hacks that we've seen in recent years. These are uh, recent months even uh, that were very high profile. And when we're talking about security of bridges, I think it's, it's probably helpful to just sort of identify what are the main problems with current bridges uh, that, uh, you know, that, that uh, well, are, are centralized uh, to, to, uh, to outline how your solution is, is an improvement? So broadly, most bridges are set up as a multi-sig. Um, either a pure multi-sig, which is backed with trust, so that's something like Wormhole, where you have essentially a company that is standing behind that multi-sig, or uh, a different type of, essentially a multi-sig, actually a TSS. Um, whereby you essentially have a, a group of nodes who have put stake in. The, uh, and the idea is that the stake uh, keeps those nodes honest. The problem with, obviously, the trusted version is it's completely trusted. Um, and, and probably with regulation coming in, it'll be harder for people to use those kind of trusted um, bridges. But the other issue with the sort of more, um, the ones that aim to have some decentralization through using stake is that ultimately you, you can get to a point where the bridge has too much value on it and you can't really secure just an arbitrary amount of value with stake. Uh, you can end up in a way with a run on the bridge. Uh, we haven't seen it yet, but it wouldn't be surprising. And then of course, when you have these sort of multi-six setups, you do have the possibility of attack. Something like Ronin is a good example there. All right, and you mentioned the state connector. You also have, uh, that is part of your bridging uh, infrastructure is called layer cake. And layer cake to me sounds like a metaphor, is it? <laughs> so yes. Can you explain yes. that a bit? So it's essentially we want to be able to bridge between all the different L1s and L2s. Um, Layer cake uses the state connector. So it's essentially a product that we're building on top of Flare. Um, layer cake is interesting. It has a different design uh, to the existing bridges. So basically, the operators of layer cake, they move collateral. So let's say you're operating ETH bridges between any chain. They move collateral from ETH to Flare. Flare holds that in a smart contract the state connector can observe what has happened on the chain. Each smart contract can only move in, in one time step. Each smart contract can only move the amount of collateral that is held on Flare. And so that, this is in contrast to the, say, the existing bridge model, where when you get an attack, you, know, you, you see the attacker trying to move essentially as much value as they can out of the bridge. 
So this is sort of acts as a natural speed limit to the bridge. But it means that you can have as much value on either side as you want, but you just have a, a, a essentially an amount that can be bridged in a particular period of time. Uh, we think this gives a lower attack surface, but it also means that that, um, that collateral can be used to bail out the bridge if the people who are operating the bridge are either attacked or are malicious. And it can bail it out 100%, which is why we call it in short bridging. Uh -huh. Yeah, so w we've seen, for example, in uh, the wormhole exploit uh, where the collateral of ETH, in this case, was drained very quickly uh, in, in mass. And so you're saying because it's, uh, this, this puts sort of limits on how much collateral can be uh, taken in any particular period of time, then that, that sort of thing is not possible. Yeah, so there's kind of a trade-off between speed and safety. You know, uh, we can also, with layer cake, we can move any amount of value between two chains, but we're just going to do it a lot, a lot more slowly. Um, uh, because otherwise, you know, you do have that issue. And, you know, if you look at something like Ronin, they didn't appear to have a particularly, uh, you know, robust warning system to be able to observe that they were being hacked. Um, and so, yeah, we, we basically have this concept that we have what's known as bandwidth, monetary bandwidth. And we hold this collateral, which represents the bandwidth. And the amount of bandwidth that's available is essentially how much that can move between different chains. Mm -hmm. And does it, that amount of bandwidth can, can scale uh, up based on uh, uh, the amount of uh, people that are uh, interested in using the bridge and providing Yeah, it's, essentially it works a bit like a, a, a DeFi protocol. You know, the more collateral we have, uh, the more the bridge can handle. Uh, but we then have a fee market that incentivizes people with even more collateral based on how, how much utilization the bridge is getting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one of the themes of this conference is, has certainly been uh, multi-chain, multi-chain future, and uh, trying to understand the difference between multi-chain and cross-chain. Um, you have a, a term for your bridge that you called a multilateral bridge. Can you uh, elaborate a little bit on what uh, you mean by that and why that's uh, fundamentally different from existing cross-chain bridges? Okay, so I, I think we're slightly conflating two things. So the way I look at multi-chain is something like, um, you know, uh, Cosmos is multi-chain, Polkadot is multi-chain. And, and the idea there is that they have essentially a, a safe way to handle reorganizations. Cross-chain today, even, you know, with the bridges, uh, they can suffer from reorganizations on one chain against another. Um, Flare's layer cake actually takes collateral against a reorganization and hold it for you know, 12 hours to a couple of days. So if, you know, if you're bridging from one chain and that chain has a reorganization, Vitalik highlighted this very clearly in a, in a, in a Twitter uh, sort of message he put up a couple of months ago. You know, uh, the bridge can essentially lose the collateral from a, a chain reorganization. So we, we allow fee takers uh, to earn a fee for operating the bridge, but they're also providing insurance. So occasionally, when there is a chain reorganization, which is rare, they will, um, they will cover that, that, that expense. Um, but that's the difference between cross-chain and multi-chain, but multilateral bridging is a different thing. So bilateral bridging is where you have essentially a bridge, let's say from Ethereum to Solana, and a bridge to Ethereum to Cosmos. Um, and let's say you move ETH to Solana and you also move ETH to Cosmos. So now you have SETH and you have CETH. Now you want to move either of those tokens to Avalanche. The problem is that you now get two more tokens out on Avalanche. You get ACETH and ASETH, and those aren't fungible. And what this does is it completely fragments liquidity, meaning you have to swap and the swap markets are very expensive. Um, or have been, so, you know, here to four. Um, with layer cake, because Flare sits in the middle of it all, we can enable you to bridge, so, so long as you're using the layer cake system, the layer cake contract on a chain will treat tokens coming from any other chain from which there's a layer cake contract equally. So your CETH and your SETH are just issued as one standard wrapped ETH on, say, Avalanche. Right, so this is... Uh, um Wrapped assets, when you a lot of the, the existing bridges work by putting in native the native asset, let's say ETH, and then what you get out is is a representation of that ETH that's locked on Ethereum mainnet. Um, but that wrapped asset, what you're saying is is uh, in in many cases only valid on the chain in which it's issued. Well, all the bridges have different properties, so you can't really treat each 
bridged token equally, but by building essentially, uh, rather than trying to build bilateral bridges, you know, a, a good, good thing to remember is if you're trying to build bilateral bridges across, say, the top 100 chains, uh, you would need 4,950 bridges to connect them all up. Um, whereas we can do that just with 100 smart contracts, one smart contract on each chain that can basically, uh, because Flare can observe all the rest of the chains. So what then is the, the role of the state connector in all this? So the state connector essentially um, enables the insurance to be paid out when there's a malfunction. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of, um, uh, it, it's, it's related to oracles of, of the... Uh, uh, so the state connector allows Flare to have essentially a view or come to consensus on the state of any chain or, or in fact any, any API. Yeah, let's let's maybe look at this by just giving an example. What what a user who uh, wants to uh, do something with their ETH on another chain, um, how would they uh, make use of this uh, bridging solution in a way that they can't now? Sure. So say they want to move ETH to Solana, uh, you know they can move it to the layer cake contract on Ethereum. Uh, the when whilst their money is in transit, it's insured on Flare. Uh, the people operating the bridge will essentially uh, sign the transaction over on Solana. Uh, they'll take the fee for doing the bridge, which is why they've put up the collateral in the first place. And now they have, uh, let's call it S ETH, right? Uh, layer kick S ETH. Uh, so they can use it in DeFi and whatever. Maybe the DeFi returns are not as good or something happens over on another chain. Now, instead of having to bridge back to Ethereum and then bridge from Ethereum to Solana, they can just bridge directly, sorry, from Ethereum to, say, Avalanche. They can now just bridge directly from Solana uh, to Avalanche. Uh -huh. So then this goes a long way to addressing the broader problem of liquidity fragmentation? Uh, we think so, yes. Yeah. Um, how, do, how, would that, how is that going to, in the long run, benefit all of DeFi, uh, if, we, if we do imagine a, a multi-chain world, um, uh, uh, where, where does that, what, can you flesh out a little bit what, what the, the, uh, the importance of, of trying to, to solve liquidity fragmentation on different chains is? So I think a good parallel is like, imagine you have a, a, a dollar yield instrument from you know, one bank in say New York that's you know, AAA rated. Let's say you have another dollar yield instrument from a bank in somewhere else that's maybe BBB rated. You simply can't treat those assets the same. So you can't, they don't provide the same function because your risk on them is, is, is different. And that's what bridges today are doing because you know, you're ending up with weirdly different assets all over the place with lots of, you know, lots of different letters and you know, names in front of them. Uh, and so what this could do is it could help smooth out essentially you, know, you can defi protocols on any chain that can take in a layer cake asset assuming you know they like layer cake um, and this just allows you to essentially use your eth on any chain and then that that would also avoid uh, users uh, user error in a sense that uh, we, we currently see sometimes uh, you read stories on Twitter about uh, a user who has a, a particular flavor of wrapped asset and uh, and then they, they send it to an exchange, let's say, but that exchange hasn't yet enabled that particular flavor, um, and it basically ends up just stuck somewhere, and maybe the exchange can, can, can get it out uh, you know, eventually. And I, I think another good example of this is also, um, we think we can apply the same model so that we can have NFT bridging, um, whereby the user specifies how much insurance they want. And then whilst we don't think that's particularly interesting when it comes to, say, art NFTs, it gets a bit more interesting when it's like game assets and you want to be able to use a game on uh, di you know, different chains. And uh, you know, let's say you, you have some asset that is equally valid in a game that's you know, pegged to Solana and uh, it's the same game asset that's equally valid um, on, a, on a chain pegged to, say, Avalanche. Uh, you know, so you can move that asset. But also importantly, you can probably build a DEX for say in-game commodities like gold or rubies or whatever, um, which allows people to trade those assets and for whatever they need in a particular game. Well, that's really interesting, and that's that's actually a use case I hadn't really thought of. But of course, we're very likely to see much a greater proliferation of different chains, uh, you know, app-specific chains, 
as well for, for something like games that Absolutely. are part of the high bandwidth. Yeah, uh, yeah so there'll be, there'll be uh, s you know, single purpose or, or limited purpose, more centralized but higher, higher throughput. Uh, and you, what you're saying is that th this could provide a, a framework for, for taking these NFTs that, that broadly represent the same item or class of item and, and being able to pass them around between these chains. Pass them around or basically create a new form of DeFi where you're, you can trade essentially in game commodities. Uh -huh. Anyway, Flare has yet to launch. Um, I understand it's uh, getting ready for audit and then you get to go on vacation. <laughs> but. Uh, uh, in, in, in the best uh, case scenario, uh, what, are, what are the plans? When is it plan, planning to launch? So our canary net's up, and that's testing the, um, the price oracle. And yesterday, we released the client side for the state connector, which is on our canary net. It's called Songbird. Uh, so we're in audit now with a very large audit company, uh, Trailer Fits. And um, assuming the audit goes well, we'll release in, in uh, July. Hopefully July 4th, that would be quite fun. Um, and then we'll be, uh, we hope to get layer cake out by the end of the year. I guess a uh, reference to the Independence Day uh, here. Uh, you're you're uh, not, not a native of, of, of US, I gather, but. I, I'm not, but my co-founder is. Uh, excellent. Uh, well, uh, yeah, then good luck with, with the audit and uh, look forward to, uh, to testing it out and seeing uh, what, what can be built on top. Thank you. Thanks very much for your attention.